What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Untangling Climate Finance. I'm the host, Jay Tipton. In this episode, I'll be chatting with a legend in the environmental protection space, Paula DePerna. For those of you that listened to my prior podcast, Work Green, Earn Green, you might remember Paula. She joined as a special guest in each episode, providing absolutely invaluable insights into the complex environmental topics that we explored. Paula got her professional start under the wing of the renowned oceanographer, filmmaker, and author, Captain Jacques Cousteau. Her time with the Cousteau Society helped launch her lifelong mission on addressing ecological challenges. Paula currently serves as a special advisor at CDP North America, as well as an advisor to the Integrity Council for the Voluntary Carbon Market. Paula has played a key role in developing carbon markets and formerly served as the president of the Chicago Climate Exchange, which was the world's first cap-and-trade system. She was also instrumental in launching China's first pilot carbon market, the Tianjin Climate Exchange. Last, but certainly not least, she is an accomplished author and commentator. So in this episode, we'll discuss her new book, Pricing the Priceless, the financial transformation to value the planet, solve the climate crisis, and protect our most precious assets. But enough from me, let's get into the combo. Paula, welcome to Untangling Climate Finance. How have you been? What have you been up to lately? Oh, just writing a book or two. How are you? It's good to be back. <laughs> yes, you have been, uh, and we're going to get into that. I'm ex very excited to talk about your book. I bought it two weeks ago, and I finished it over the weekend. Good. We like books that get finished, So, uh, and you'll be, uh, I'm sure, full of questions, I hope. So looking forward to it, and thanks for, thanks for being interested. Of course. Obviously, I know you very well because we've talked in podcast format and a different podcast a million times, but why don't you tell the audience and the listeners a little bit about yourself, your background, what you're up to? Obviously, you just said you're writing a book, but um, who is Paula? Well, if I knew the answer, you know, that's everybody's question. So, you know, fundamentally, I'm, uh, I'm a writer. I have been a, a journalist and a writer for quite a while. I started writing uh, about public schools in New York City. I grew up in New York City. I went to graduate and undergraduate school in New York City, and I didn't have many environmental leanings. And I started my career, as I said, writing about public schools for the Village Voice, which was a kind of feisty investigative uh, publication. And I was having some success and I thought, well, you know, this is going pretty well. Why don't you uh, see if you can expand your topic areas? And so I um, was given a Christmas present of a membership in uh, something called the Cousteau Society. And it came with a subscription to their newsletter. And in the newsletter, there was a little tiny ad that said, volunteer writers wanted. Jacques Cousteau has a book contract to write the Cousteau Almanac. And I thought, oh, fine, you know, I'll volunteer and work for them. I'll learn something about the oceans, I thought, since Cousteau was known for that. And I volunteered. They uh, offered me a full-time job the next day. I was not expecting that, but they said they had one job available for salary. Did I want it? And uh, I took it and thought I'd only be around as long as the book contract. But then I ended up staying with Cousteau for a big chunk of my career and went on to become a key film writer for him and a producer and traveled all over and vice president for international affairs, which was really a policy role to help Cousteau use his access to uh, push policy forward. And then that, that changed everything for me. That was a, a life transformation, a life-changing experience, as we say. And then I went on to become um, president of a, of a major philanthropy in the United States called the uh, Joyce Foundation, as well as helping start the first cap-and-trade carbon market in the world at the time, known as the uh, Chicago Climate Exchange, which then we, <coughs> excuse me, we which then we uh, translated into a, a series of international subsidiaries. So we had really the first international carbon market too. And then I became an advisor to the Carbon Disclosure Project, known as CDP, and I'm still there doing that as an advisor. And all of this has led me to uh, this book, Pricing the Priceless, which in some ways I like to think is a culmination of my thinking and my experiences. It's sort of Paula meets environmental economics 
which one way or another have been touching since I started working with Cousteau, I have to say. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you foreshadowed a couple of the topics that we're going to talk about in this uh, conversation. But that was my take as well, is that as I'm reading this and I can hear you narrating it throughout the entire book, I'm like, I'm getting these personal anecdotes from your life, which are very fascinating experiences that you've had, but also like building on top of them one after the other into what you get to, which is, you know, pricing the priceless. So a very awesome uh, book and a very awesome journey. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. So along the way, it would be safe to say that your adventures and all of this stuff also turned you into a bit of an environmentalist and advocate for our planet, correct? Yeah, correct. Uh, because, you know, the more you are out and about, and I was lucky to be in magnificent places, but also it's just, it kind of is inescapable. You know, it's one of those things you sort of wish it wouldn't be an inescapable, but it it kind of, especially at this moment, it is inescapable. And so, yes, I am. But, but I'm. An, I like to think, you know, I'm not really. Uh, I don't wear it. I just try to think it and act it, without giving up life's pleasures, because that is a problem. I think you can't really expect people to sacrifice what we've become accustomed to, but yet we do have to uh, sacrifice things. So it's a fine line. Yeah, it's a balance. It's a definitely a delicate balance. So we're going to pivot to the book. The book that we are referring to, just so the listeners know, is called Pricing the Priceless, The Financial Transformation to Value the Planet, Solve the Climate Crisis, and Protect Our Most Precious Assets. And in this book, you're telling stories that are coupled with powerful messages, I would say, that are simply about protecting our planet. And as you put it, pricing the priceless. And so what this is referring to is actually trying to put a price on all of the resources and the benefits that Earth has continuously provided us as humanity on our quest for global and human and societal development. And the stories are great. You visit the Pope and the Vatican. You tell an incredible story about Detroit, which is linked to, to their art and kind of how this saved the city from economic ruin, which was, I think, my favorite chapter. But I will stop and I will just say, tell me about the book and tell me the message you wanted to get across to your readers. Well, as I said, it's sort of Paula meets environmental economics. So so at the at the top level, what is environmental economics? It's looking at the environmental the relationship of environmental resources to economics. And to date, that has been a process where environmental factors have been called external literally called externalities, and they haven't been brought into the books and they haven't been accounted for as economic uh, values. They've only really been accounted for as raw material. And so the book really flips that. And the goal, you know, so a couple of insights and things that, that animated the book, I, the more I got into it, the more I realized, you know, nature is really the world's most exploited worker. Right. And, and probably the most exploited worker in the history of the world in that nature performs all of this this work for us, not to mention, I mean, not only obviously fresh air and not only fresh water, but now we're talking about cleaning water, filtering water, pollination, lumber, soil, food, you know, everything, everything. And it's a, been a free ride, mm -hmm. you know, talk about cheap labor undercutting costs, cheap labor, nature is the cheapest of all because it's been free. And the result is what we see. Mm -hmm. uh, I think yesterday uh, was a world overshoot day, that being August 2, uh, the carbon footprint net network. Okay. Their calculations are probably a bit, a bit on the rough side, but even so, you know, they said that the, the earth has used up in eight months, what nature provides in t over 12. Right. So we're already just this year alone for eight, you know, four months overdrawn on our checking account with nature. Yeah. So one key idea that I wanted to explore in, in the book was that, you know, it isn't just putting a price on nature, it's, it's pricing the benefits of nature. And so once you start going into that, you get these astronomical figures. So you get $125 trillion a year is the value of the ecosystem services, which is to say that nature's services, nature's work contributes to the world economy. Well, GDP of the world is is barely 125 trillion a year. So on one level, you get figures that by academic research that 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 dwarf the the, the the global GDP. And at the other end, you have the World Economic Forum, which I think two years ago uh, estimated the contribution of nature to the world's 
economy at about 45 trillion a year. So that's about half the GDP. Mm -hmm. So somewhere between half the GDP and more than the GDP is this hidden subsidy or unaccounted subsidy we're getting from nature. And that masks what's going on, which is the catastrophe of what Partha Das Gupta calls, the economist who wrote the bio- economics of biodiversity, depreciation. Now, these are crass terms, you know, depreciation, that's what happens to your car. You don't think of it as a term that you'd apply to a forest, but that's what's happening. Portfolio management, which is another term he uses, you don't really want to say that water and air and fish and birds are part of a portfolio. But they are, once you start looking into the economics of of how it works. Mm -hmm. And so why I undertook the book was to try to humanize and personalize and make credible this paradox that we're living in a world where everything that, that, that we depend on is priceless and is deteriorating. And... So therefore, if we don't come to terms with the economics of it and, and recognize recognize in our books that we need to protect these assets as if they were gold, because they are, mm-hmm. then we're going to have what we're having, which is a tremendously unfair distribution of wealth, but as well a depreciation. And, and it's everywhere. Everything is depreciating everywhere. So the idea of the book was to try to bring this down to earth and explore this uh, as an ordinary person might myself not being a financial person. I'm not an investor. I'm not uh, someone who, I don't have an MBA. My degrees are in literature. Uh, so so I just thought it'd be, it would be potentially useful to bring people along on a journey to explore this, this, this paradox. And so that was kind of why I did the book. Yeah. And also, as I had said, like going back to the fact that your personal experiences in this journey that you've had have always kind of kept you, despite not being an economist or despite not being a financial person, dancing in that dance. Your work at the Chicago Climate Exchange and then what you did in in China, establishing the climate exchange there. It's like, these are huge economic systems, the carbon markets we're going to talk about in a little bit, but you know, you've been in this realm and you've had a first person vision of it the entire way. And so I, I think that that uniquely positioned you to bring this very Paula-esque perspective to what's happening, both because you've seen it with your eyes and the degradation of the the planet over time, but then also have seen these major economic systems that have been in place or established or attempted to, to at least do something in recognizing the value of nature. And so what I want to talk about now is actually the compliance carbon markets or the carbon markets in general, because in my opinion, carbon markets are definitely one of our strongest tools that we have to provide a price on the price list and to actually help ourselves in the overall goal that we need to do, which is decarbonize at a a very rapid rate. And so you have two experiences, probably more, but two very strong experiences. The first is that you were essentially one of the pioneers of a carbon market, which was when you help establish the the Chicago Climate Exchange, the CCX, you served as the president of the international division at the CCX. And that was the world's first cap and trade system. Now the CCX no longer operates, but there are many other carbon trading systems across the world. And so I know that maybe some of my listeners will understand what cap and trade is or or carbon markets are, but could you very briefly describe for them how a traditional cap and trade system works? Give us the elevator pitch of it. Yeah, I keep working on trying to perfect that. But uh, so people, you know, who don't, it came as a shock and and surprise to me, really, that uh, the atmosphere You know, you look at the earth and one of the quotes that I'll never forget, and I've never been able to really track it to the actual astronaut, but one of the astronauts on the fifth space shuttle journey from the United States said something like, you know, when I looked back at the atmosphere, I could see that it was in the same relationship to the planet as the peach fuzz is to the peach. And, you know, when you think about that, if you rub your face, you know, that, that, that your face is there, but, but the little bit of hair that, that's on your face, that's it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's a halo. It's such a tiny space. It's 60 miles, 60 miles between the top of your head to the end of the atmosphere that's protecting us from intense solar radiation. Now, if that little halo can no longer protect us, we get what we're getting, which is these extreme heats and extreme weather events. 
and that 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 little thin atmosphere is being crowded with weather that can't move because when when a spring you know when an intense storm forms it doesn't have as much room to move as it used to which is why these storms stay over you know hold over it rains 15 days it doesn't rain two days you know the, the, there's just not room up there mm-hmm. so if you think about it as room and space and you begin to understand that it's very limited what the cap and trade does is define that scarcity and say okay this is the atmosphere and how much room is there still in it and okay there's two miles how do we use that two miles you know do we just keep doing uh, letting emissions go up there willy-nilly or do we try to cap them meaning limit them so generally, the way the cap and trade works is a, is a is a regulatory authority, either a government of a country or international governance like the European Union, or in the case of Chicago Climate Exchange, a voluntary group who, which is willing to sign a contract, which these our members were, agreeing to a cap and saying, you know, in the next five years, I'm not going to emit any more than a hundred tons of CO2, and if I have to go over that, I'm going to agree to pay. And I'm going to pay whom? Well, the ones, the people who are in the same family there, the same cap and trade have agreed to the same 100 100 ton limit, who maybe don't need to use up their 100 tons and who have uh, over complied, shall we say, with with the limit. And so they have a kind of a little bit of a surplus. And that's valuable because we're both occupying the very same space. Neither one of us has more room. Mm-hmm. And so the, the surplus that you may have is valuable to me because for whatever reason, including mainly that maybe I did try to put solar panels on my factory and they failed. You know, we never account for the fact that these technologies might fail. What if in the best faith, I tried to change my energy mix at my factory and something went wrong? So now having pledged to remove to reduce my emissions, I can't. And so, but you, 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 you did. Your your solar panels, for example, didn't fail. So you have surplus. I'm short, and you and I bargain. So the price of those the, of those permits, those allowances, if you think about them as occupancy fees, those prices fluctuate. And on a given day, you know, they may be worth. It may it may be worth it to me to buy from you as opposed to go out and buy a whole new set of solar panels, which will cost me more than than I can afford to install. Yeah. So the cap and trade the cap and trade is 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 a way for us to recognize the scarcity of the atmosphere and pay to occupy it, and what we want is the highest possible price. So gradually, every couple of years, the the authorities running the cap and trade tighten up the limits. They say, okay, look, two years ago, you could emit 100 tons. Now now you can only emit 80. And it tightens and tightens and tightens. And that through su- supply and demand, you know, increases the price in theory. Mm-hmm. The cap and trade is, is just a tool. It's one of many, but it's a very important tool. And it has worked before. It worked, it was invented as a tool in the United States in the 70s uh, to try to um, address acid rain and focus on one single pollutant at the time, sulfur dioxide. And it's been expanded to try to cover all six greenhouse gases, although most of the cap and trades today uh, are still only focused on CO2. But I credit my involvement with that to Richard Sandor, who is a well-known economist and also a very forward thinker, a financial inventor. And he was asked by the UN in the early 90s at the Earth Summit whether that cap and trade the Clean Water Act and uh, Clean Air Act, sorry, in the United States had put into place could be adapted to climate change. Yeah. And his insight was, I don't know, but I don't see why not. So let's try it. Yeah. And that's what CCX tried to do. I think the thing today to know is that these cap and trade, there's now multiple different caps and trades in the world, the largest being in the United in the European Union, but they're not knitted together. And so Back to the peach fuzz, little bits of peach fuzz are limited and the emissions are limited slices or snippets of that halo. And what we need to do is limit emissions that go into the entire halo. 
that's the point. And so we're far from that right now. And I would say that's the most important thing to do right away. Yeah, and I'm with you. Definitely in the US. I mean, as you said, the EU has theirs, China has various regional ones, and then they also have their national one, which doesn't, of course, cover all of their emissions, but a, a, a very strong chunk of it. But in the US, there are a few regional compliance carbon markets. We've got the California, which is covering electricity. There's Reggi or the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative that's on the the Northeast and on the East Coast it covers a handful of states there, although Virginia is trying to walk back their involvement. Um, the newly launched Washington State Cap and Invest, but on a national scale, we do not have a U.S. cap and trade and we don't have a U.S. carbon trading system. And so, although if we were to put one in place, I think that would be pretty effective. And so, why do you think that is? Why do you think we we don't have one? What is the, the biggest roadblock for the U.S. to get there, despite the fact that regional areas do have them and they are working? Yeah, well, that's the, that's the main question. I mean, back to pricing the priceless, what are we pricing? We're pricing the scarcity of the atmosphere, about which nobody can disagree. But somehow, and it's a function of communication, I think, and and a little bit of the complexity of the system, but, but cap and trade is just like, you know, if somebody invented, when they invented the hammer and the nail, nobody really said, are we sure it's going to work? Or are we sure this hammer is going to get that nail into the wood? No, everybody tried it. Right. And whereas cap and trade, people keep trying to perfect it. They keep trying to take shots at it, you know, that God forbid, or, you know, if, if the fact that you in the example, I somehow didn't meet my my obligation, and you did better than I did. So you're letting me off the hook. The idea that the cap and trade system permits some people to delay their compliance, which is part of how it functions by, you know, flexibility, that flexibility has drawn suspicion. Yeah. And there's a school of thought that says anything to do with the environment and protecting the environment should be punitive, that it's bad to have been a polluter and therefore it should be a punishment for polluters. So a couple of reasons. One, the, the institutional knowledge of, to build carbon markets that had been building up in the early 90s, with the Kyoto Protocol, when there was enthusiasm for these systems. One, a lot of that was lost when when the momentum in the United States crashed, when the Waxman-Markey bill failed. Mm -hmm. Why did it fail? Because people, just what I said, people thought it was suspicious. It didn't get across in the Senate because of the senators uh, proposing it, uh, Lindsey Graham, John Kerry, and um, Joe Lieberman were not the most popular senators in the Senate, and they just failed to mobilize their peers. The Obama administration backed off of it because public sentiment was disintegrating. Oh, we, we're not going to let people off the hook. Yeah. And the other thing is a feeling that there's no upside to a cap and trade, whereas the revenue generated by a cap and trade, if it's well managed, the transaction fees that are paid by the polluters, those right can go right back to the public budget, which is what the cap and invest principle is. So, you know, if I were a president... <laughs> And I was also at the same time the head of the Supreme Court and the head of the Congress. I would say that knitting together these regional caps and trades in the in the United States would be the first and most foremost thing to do. And you could almost do it through the action of an individual company. For example, there are companies that operate in New York that also operate in California, have operations in Washington State and likely elsewhere. And what if that one company just said, you know what, we're going to participate in all of these markets because we're touched by all of these uh, regulations one way or another. And so basically regulate us as if we were in all these jurisdictions because we operate in all of them. Yeah. And then de facto, you have a national operation. And the reason, you know, to your question, the reason that these knitting together, this knitting together hasn't happened, I think, is one regional pride, which is misplaced, political fear, and just it's hard. You know, if this was easy, people would have done it. And I think we just have to keep pushing on the hard stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And I do think, though, there is value in, in what you just touched upon, especially with the cap invest, is highlighting the benefits that these fees that you're collecting then do go back into the community in one form or another, right? California released a couple months ago uh, a summary of where the money was going, and it was pretty impressive. I mean, programs from the north of the state all the way down to the south of the state, helping with inequality, helping with low income communities a lot of climate resilience, all sorts of things. And so it's, you know, highlighting this 
idea that it isn't just a, a fee. It's not just a penalty. Uh, it has a lot of beneficial elements to it, reducing obviously the greenhouse gas emissions, which is the overarching goal, but then also cycling this money back into the state and giving it back to the people in one form or another is it's crucial to its success. And so I think that, of course, like the political will and the regional pride, as you mentioned, are huge roadblocks. But I do think that highlighting how well, if done correctly, they can. And I think that the ones that are up and running in the U.S. are actually doing what they're supposed to be doing is, is also an important part of getting this lifted off of the ground. I look at the future of the political landscape in the U.S. and I and I can't say I'm like super optimistic that I see something like this developing anytime soon. But then at the same time, when you see all these corporations and companies on their own independently committing to uh, decarbonization goals or net zero goals or things like that, then it, 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 you do kind of get this optimism that it could happen. Yeah. And, you know, I think, again, people once people start seeing it on their books, the costs we've reached a point where where the costs are really visible and when you open your eyes to the priceless to pricing and to pricing something like the atmosphere in itself the atmosphere is priceless but the remaining room in it is very it has to be very expensive to occupy mm -hmm. you know why would you just allow this very rare space to be occupied you you don't let penthouses i talk about in the book you know Penthouses are the high, most expensive apartments and rental spaces in the world. And we figure out how to price that relative to the whole building. Yep. So, um, and another thing that's, that, uh, that I think is potentially relevant, I mean, the price of participation in the cap and trade, you know, the high carbon price that we're looking for doesn't fall necessarily on the consumer. It falls on the polluter. I mean, certain prices to, at the consumer level probably will rise, but there've been so many studies about what a hundred dollar a ton carbon price would mean at the pump. And it very, it's, it's, it's very little because the whole idea is to get away from gasoline anyway. Yeah. But what, what the hundred dollar a ton price does is also incentivize significantly transition to, you know, alternatives, which is also a key part. And so Puma, you probably read about this in, in the book, Puma, the major uh, sports companies used to be run by a very forward thinking fellow named uh, Jochen Zeitz. And um, he uh, required his company to produce an environmental P&L back in 2010. Now, every business person, every stockholder, every securities regulator, everybody who knows anything about corporate corporations understands what a profit and loss is. Nonprofit organizations have a profit and loss. They don't call it profit, but they, they know what red ink and black ink are. And so what Jochen Zeitz did was require his uh, auditor team to uh, and his financial teams. So that I think they showed in the classic P&L, 202 Euro, a million euros a, of, of revenue that year. And he said, okay, great. Now, what if we had to pay the costs of our negative impact? What if we had to pay to filter the water, clean the water that we use? What if we had to own the land on which the animals that are grazing, who give us our fiber and who give us our leather, what if we had to own that land and, and take care of it? What if we had to pay a carbon price for our emissions? What if we had to pay to dispose of the waste that we generate? What would all those costs be? And they, you know, used surrogate pricing and some, in some cases, actual pricing like land value and so on. And it's unbelievable. They came up with 145 million euro costs, which is a big chunk out of 202. I mean, it leaves them with 25% of the revenue that they thought they had. Yeah. So that's a tremendous hidden cost. And if you're a shareholder in a company that you think is making 202 million and is actually making 202 million minus 145, your share value really goes down as well. Right, right. So, you know, these are things that are beginning to cook and beginning to uh, rethink and redefine our accounting system, but not fast enough. Yeah. And do you think in the absence of a U.S. carbon trading system that there could be another version down the road of a CCX where the companies are voluntarily doing this? And let me give you a little bit of context. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Trove Research, but it's an incredible research group that focuses on the VCM, the voluntary carbon market. And they are always, I think on quarterly, they are sending out updates with the current amount of companies that are committing to net zero or decarbonization goals by 2040, 2050, et cetera. And they track these on a general scale, but then they also track 
the ones that are committing to science-based target initiatives. So like real concrete decarbonization plans that are linked up with science. And these companies are doing this voluntarily. And right now, last I checked at least, the, the amount of commitments from global companies was sitting around 5,500. I'm not sure the exact amount of companies that you had at the, the peak of CCX, but if you imagine that there's 5,500 companies that have voluntarily committed to decarbonization and they're doing it in a space where there isn't some sort of regulation that they could theoretically come together in a form of CCX manner to say, hey, we're in this together. A bunch of us have committed to these types of decarbonization goals. Why don't we exist in a, a voluntary version of decarbonization or a cap and trade? Is this something that you could imagine happening in the future? Oh, yeah. I mean, I try to talk about it as much as, as possible and encourage that. And, you know, there are some people thinking about it. You know, again, the companies, I mean, one of the complicating factors at the, at the Waxman Markey time and um, would also be fa a factor now, uh, well, several things. I mean, we had, we had more baseline capped under CCX on a voluntary basis with a civil contract than if you combined Reggie and California today. We dwarfed it. Our baseline was nearly a billion tons. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. I mean, it, it is incredible. You could add all the baselines of all the regionals in the United States and we would have dwarfed it. And why did we get that many companies to step up? Because it was an early adopter network. It was a network of people who understood that carbon pricing was, was inevitable. And even if it wasn't inevitable at a, at a regulatory level, which, it, which they mostly thought, they fully understood that they needed to know what that cost, that, that, that free ride or that hitchhiker, that pollution cost was uh, because it, in, it was an inherent risk, either a regulatory risk or a physical risk. And we've seen that. Now, yesterday or the day before, Fitch has just downgraded the, the AAA bond rating of the United States. Well, yeah. Fitch's was, was writing in 2003 about the likelihood of credit ratings being downgraded because of carbon risk. Uh, forest fires in California, all those, you know, companies, uh, a lot of them, uh, Southern, what was it? Southern California downgraded. So, you know, if you combine the mindset of we need to price carbon because it's scarce and priceless uh, space, we need to identify the cost that's, that, that's invisible to our operations. We need to make that visible somehow. And you you factor in, and also by the way, I am an invest. I am a, an investor in green tech. I'm selling solar panels. I want, you know, I want people to buy them. Um, that's another constituency for an organizational approach to to cap and trade among the the willing, you know, the willing volunteers, which is probably a very large community, as you you said. Now, we need a rule based structure to organize that voluntary effort. So, partly. What I said earlier was that a company that has, you know, emission profile in various jurisdictions, some of which would be capped and some of which not, could at the individual company level volunteer to follow the rules of all of the different jurisdictions and therefore be part of a mandatory market in all, throughout its corporate operations, which would help them smooth out the cost of compliance or, or smooth out the costs of addressing physically the events that occur, like extreme weather events that disrupt supply chain. And then for those who, who aren't in any jurisdiction, you could imagine creating another framework, uh, another format with a contract. And then what you'd probably need to do simultaneously, which was what we were trying to do at, at CCX, was get some kind of uh, reciprocity so that a company that was volunteering to reduce emissions could be recognized by that mandatory system whenever that mandatory cap would fall over, yeah. or would come to apply to my early action. So, you know, one of the things that, that we don't do well is reward companies. I mean, I know there's plenty of rapacious companies out there, but a company that takes an early action and then doesn't get any recognition for it, is, is stiffed. And so, you know, if a company steps out ahead of time, you know, maybe those tons that they reduce need to fall into their plus column, even if it's not ton for ton, maybe at a discount, but that, that, that was, uh, uh, would be something that would have to 
be thought of because you want these uh, markets to be harmonized. You don't want uh, a mixed bag of baselines. And that's why it's taking so long to to advance on Article 6, which is the UN uh, roadmap for uh, integrating uh, carbon markets, which is taking forever because of the leakage problem. Well, I reduce in Romania, but not in Zimbabwe, but I do in Mongolia, but not in Pakistan, and yes, in Paris, but not in uh, you know Taiwan. I produce in Taiwan, so the tons that I produce there, are they going to be accredited to my account in, in Switzerland because that's where my headquarters is? You know, all of these things seem very difficult, but they are actually, all they are are tedious. They're not difficult. And the coordination can happen. And the fact that I think that there's enough of these systems that are in place, which means that there's references to pull from good and bad. Uh, I think that that is at our advantage in this effort. However, as you said, the the progress on Article 6 is painstakingly slow. Uh, every cop passes and it just seems like nothing happens. So, you know, let's see what happens this coming year, but you never know. So I want to talk about China, specifically their their trading system, because your your efforts at CCX caught the attention of some uh, diplomats or businessmen over in China. And you talk about this over in your book. And so you were very instrumental in the launch of CCX. And then you get recruited basically to help launch the Tianjin Climate Exchange, the TCX. Uh, and that went into effect in December 2013. Uh, it was the first, correct me if I'm wrong, it was the first carbon trading scheme in China at the time. Now there are handful in cities and regions of China, as well as China's national ETS that started in 2021. I believe it covers about 4.5 billion tons of CO2, which in China's perspective is like a fraction of their total output. But if you compare it to the US, it's almost the entire uh, US's greenhouse gas output. So explain and talk about the importance of China, uh, which is a huge emitter and a massive economy, the world's second biggest economy in having a, a national emissions trading scheme on top of these regional ones? Like, why does that matter and why is that important? Yeah, so it was 2008, by the way, Tianjin Climate Exchange. And I was just thinking of that this morning because um, I vividly remember August 8, 2008. I think that was the opening of the Beijing Olympics. <laughs> and uh, as I say in the book, everyone was flying into Beijing that day. Me, I'm flying out because we. I had flown over to sign the... Uh, agreement to launch the Tianjin Climate Exchange, and eight is a very auspicious number in Chinese culture. So eight, eight, eight was like irresistible. <laughs> but um, anyway, the importance was, and at that time, you know, we had a different kind of government in China. But you know, the Chinese have been tracking carbon pricing, and in fact, the career of Richard Sandor for many, many years. And so when we got over there, you know, there was an academic understanding of, of, of carbon markets, but they, they had already figured out that the carbon market was going to be important. And I think at the time, probably they understood it would be important as a support for green products, which they wanted to master and which they have mastered. And so their enthusiasm for cap and trade did have to do with limiting pollution to an extent, but I've come to feel that it was really more about the other side, that by pricing carbon, it would drive people to green products. So they, uh, PetroChina, which was an oil company, was our partner. And why would an oil company want to partner with us to learn about what cap and trade really was? The whole TCX was a learning experience for the Chinese. And we learned a lot too. But the goal was to set up a system that would eventually become the world's largest commodity, the world's, you know, the, the largest commodities market in the history of the world, which it will be. Now, why is that important? I mean, back to back to commodities as the word you want to call the limited atmospheric space a commodity. Yeah. I think you have to because we have a structure for trading that. You know, we don't need a new structure. People understand commodities, and so if if the scarce space in the atmosphere is a commodity, then having a really educated group of people, people who know well how to trade commodities, trading it, and also the framework and rules to make sure that the commodity is based on an environmental benefit. You know, no environmental benefit, no value to the carbon price. So that's that's something that that's very critical. But but the importance of China and and again they were this was during the Obama years and there was a handshake and Obama did the clean air the clean power plan and the Chinese said okay we'll do a national cap and trade. 
And that would have been fantastic if, you know, then we'd be talking about knitting together European Union, China, and the United States. And then what we just finished talking about, the regional ones and the volunteers, they, they wouldn't have a choice. They'd have to come into the system. Yeah. So by not, you know, overnight you would have a global system and you basically can't resolve climate change without the Chinese playing full, full roles, senior roles. Obviously, India is also very important, but India, you know, India isn't as important right now as China. India is important for emissions, but China is super important for solutions. So, um, you know, there again, we lost about a decade. But from my point of view, back to the book, I mean, it was just an ex- incredible experience to try to build this. You know, here we are in a, ca- a communist country trying to influence with a capitalistic tool that the, half the capitalists in the world didn't understand uh, it was pretty amazing. And I, uh, it was just, again, a life transformation to be there all that time, never learning Mandarin, because who can learn it? I can't learn it. And, and I mean, people can, but not me. Yeah. And being in a tennis match. And then I thought, okay, Paula, follow your own rule. Keep it simple. You only need to know what's being translated. You don't need to know everything else. And this discipline you have to have, what's the prize? The prize is getting that contract getting that thing started, the tangent climate exchange, even if it if it stumbles, just get it started. And we did. Right. Because once it's up and running, then that is a much further achievement than, you know, never getting it going and then or having to re uh, format it once the once it's begun. So uh, I think there was a moment and you described this in the book where you thought it was falling apart. Is that correct? Yeah, because, you know, we were we were partners, but part, our partners had another way of looking at it. There was also the politics. You know, we had started it in one, you know, one year, everyone was gung-ho. The next year, they, they were less gung-ho maybe. And so our idea of how you trade was not quite their idea. And we were going to supply, be part of choosing the, the staff, but, you know, they chose the staff. But but it kept on, and then Ant Financial took a share in it. We saw the reason that we 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 didn't stay in it is because we the whole business here we closed the business in the United States because Waxman Markey failed. Yeah, and uh, there wasn't going to be an, a market here in the United States. And our business plan was, you know, if we build it, they will come, and if they're trading with you, they will stay. And since there was no longer any reason to understand carbon pricing, the voluntary the early adopter network had learned what it needed to learn and decided, oh, we'll just wait and see. But, you know, it was, it was uh, uh, foundational and the Chinese built upon it and it's still there. And um, yeah, I mean, it, you know, back to the book and the whole idea of a journey, somehow we expect these environmental systems to be perfect because we're dealing with metaphysical beauty and philosophical questions and pricelessness, literally. We sort of expect that any solution will be 100% virginal, 100% virtuous. You know, nothing dirty will come near it. And that's pretty naive. There, there'll always be steps backs. There'll always be people trying to commit a fraud. There'll always be people trying to cheat or misinterpret or being too stupid to understand even what they're saying. But by that, I mean saying label a, an ESG fund in such a, a hyped up way that it can never live up to the name. I mean, that's not an outright fraud, but it's a, you know, it's a stupidity to do things that way. But even if we allow for a lot of human nature, most of these systems can work at a scale that can have an impact if we would just let them, you know, if we weren't trying to always perfect them. Absolutely. And so, you know, we've covered compliance carbon markets. We've covered the voluntary carbon market. We at Gordy Knot Strategies are very involved in both of these. We also work a lot in green bonds. What we're focused on is climate finance, and this encompasses all of the things we've talked about, and this is what your book talks about. And so when you're looking towards the future, what tools or mechanisms do you feel or do you think are the most exciting in terms of like a two-part thing, which is A, doing what it needs to do in terms of reducing uh, carbon emissions or greenhouse gas emissions, but then B, also, you know, generating economic uh, or financial return. Like what do you think is kind of, of course, there's not one answer, not one tool, but like what excites you the most or what do you think is the most interesting when we look towards the future? Well, I think, you know, building an international carbon market is a number one thing in terms of pricing the atmosphere. But in the book, I talk about a couple of other things, which I think are really fascinating, like the forest resilience bond. Uh, the, the big breakthrough there was to, you know, figure out 
again, back to pricing nature's work, what are, what are the jobs? If a forest is resilient, what is the work that it's doing? It's not just being a tree. You know, just being a tree means wood and, and leaves. But the tree is a harbor for biodiversity. The tree is holding water. The tree is retaining soil. The tree is making it possible for people to enjoy uh, recreation. The tree itself has a tremendous set of work, uh, types of work that it's performing, most of which is not being paid for. So identify the beneficiaries of all those different kinds of labor. Um, and this, the range is incredible from uh, the obvious that I mentioned, like the tourism company, to the hydropower facility that needs as much water in the water table as possible so that on dry, uh, in dry times, uh, the, the reservoirs can still draw on the water table. You know, it sounds like what, what connection could there be between a forest and a hydropower, but direct connection. Well, the Forest Resilience Bond was brilliant in that it figured out how to assign beneficiaries or rather link beneficiaries to investors. So investors up front say, okay, we can recognize there's whatever, $50 million worth of benefits coming through this forest, but not right now, but we'll upfront the money and we'll get paid by the beneficiaries later as they realize the benefits. Now that is a very creative way of using money and getting capital that 50 million could have been sitting around doing nothing, or it could have been in the wrong kind of investment, not in forest resilience, but now it is in forest resilience. And that bond went from the first one of $4 million to two new bonds, each $25 million, and now a portfolio of projects to be managed to aggregate smaller projects. So that, there's no reason why there couldn't be a forest resilient bond covering all of Canada, for example, mm-hmm. or a series of them, or any vulnerable standing forest that needs to be beefed up in terms of resilience. Because what the money does, the upfront money pays for people, literally, so jobs, to go into the forest and take care of it right. in a way that we can we can't afford to do anymore because we're prevent we're, we're, prevention is, is 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 being dwarfed by the need to put fires out. So you know the direct beneficiary of the forest resilience bond is the forest service that can now do more maintenance. Which if you call a forest an asset, yep, you got to maintain it. Call forest raw material, you can cut it down. So I'm excited about those kinds of structures that securitize the risks and bring money in for action, not just principles, you know, not just, I mean, for real action, you need a forest resilience, a resilient forest. How do we make it resilient? You need to protect coral reefs. Let's insure them. You know, it's radical. Coral reefs are buffers. Yeah. Coral reefs and mangroves. If these natural buffers hadn't been cut down in, in Myanmar, that the junta might not have fallen. Now, it's good that it fell. That was some 15 years ago. But the politics of it were such that the typhoon exposed that the junta didn't care about the people. And why did, why did that happen? Because there were no mangroves, because the junta allowed all these mangroves to be, to be decimated. Right. But if you invest up front, say, in mangrove restoration or mangrove protection, you get the same benefits as the forest resilience bond. And who would think? You insure your car, you insure your house, you insure your property. Who would think of insuring a coral reef? But it, when you get into it, it makes such sense because we insure the property on the coast at very high level, high cost, and yet the bu- the reef that's a buffer protects those coastal properties from uh, storms because it's literally a wall against the waves. Yep. We don't insure. So the parametric model, you know, coral reef insurance, all these things I think are very exciting. And they're almost a little more exciting than investing in companies because anybody can do that. That's not pricing the priceless. Pricing the priceless is invest in these intangibles, these things that have never been on the books, these things that are invaluable, but which are super valuable and can be priced to, to an extent that encourages their protection. And, you know, I think that's the exciting bit. You're right. I, I, I think that hits the nail right on the head. And I, I do think that there is momentum in this specific field. And I hope that we see more of that, especially with the bonds. But it, it does seem like uh, it's heading that direction. And there's more attention going on this type of uh, protection, this restoration, giving benefit to the ecosystem service. But uh, your book is obviously highlighting this. And so, you know, you're doing a big part in in getting this word out there and and helping us think about things in a different way, which is absolutely what needs to happen, both from the boardroom 
the decision makers all the way down to the consumers themselves. And so I think that your your book has the potential and hopefully is selling off the, the shelves to have this impact. So, well, Paula, this is a great place for us to wrap up. I appreciate you joining. I always love having a conversation with you. I, I told you this at the beginning. I thought the book was absolutely incredible. And I will include a link to the book in the show notes. Paula, you tell me which link you want and I'll add it. But always awesome to have you here. Always awesome to chat. I always learn something new and interesting. And when you said that uh, your first writing gig was for like a feisty little newsletter or newspaper, that is the word that I would apply to you, Paula, as a writer. <laughs> you you define you are the definition of that. So the book was great, and it was definitely in your unique perspective, which I loved. So thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me, Jay. Always a pleasure for me too. And I hope to see you sometime soon. Likewise. Talk soon. And that concludes today's episode. I appreciate you joining us. I'll be back in November with a lively and super sharp guest, Sean Kidney, the CEO of the Climate Bonds Initiative. Sean and I will discuss the state of bonds around the world, particularly green bonds, and how he and his organization are helping shape the overall bond space. Make sure you don't miss this great conversation. If you want to connect, you can shoot me an email. A link to my email address is in the show notes. And if you're interested in joining me for an episode, or if you have someone else in mind, I'd be happy to talk. Finally, please be sure to subscribe and leave a review on Spotify or Apple Podcast. We really appreciate reading your thoughts. All right, catch you next time. This podcast is produced by Gordian Knot Strategies.